Kazakhstan is one of the most multinational countries which gathered representatives of more than 130 ethnicities and nations. Each ethnicity has unique traditions, inimitable holidays, interesting stories and amazing recipes. Recipes of kindness and peace, recipes of respect to your own roots and other people's culture, recipes for friendship. We start the new season of Recipe for Friendship with travel to Kordai. Our new friend, Lubov Askatovna, has been living in Kazakhstan since she was 13. And today in our program, she represents Balkar diaspora in Kazakhstan. Today we are going to meet Karachai Balkar ethnicity with their traditions, culture and cuisine. And there is a good reason that two ethnicities, Karachais and Balkars, are linked in one term because they say themselves that Karachai and Balkars are two ranges of Alborus, two wings of one bird, in short, relative ethnicities that are close to each other with similar language, cuisine and lifestyle. Our new friend, mistress of the house where we were invited today, Lubov Askatovna, is an exiled. As many of her fellow countrymen. I was an orphan when I came here. My mother died. My father was off at the front and he never came back. It was war in 1944. It was good that we were sent to Kazakhstan. We have survived because of Kazakh people. They helped us a lot. They shared with us their last food. They supported us, even if we were children. However, even if we were children, we worked same as adults, 10 hours per day. Social and political events of the first half of the 20th century were quite dramatic for many people. A 13-years-old girl and her brother became victims of false accusations of whole nations of aiding the invaders and banditry. We were sent to a village in Almaty, Almaty 1, October region, village number 5. Those days people were given bread only for food carts and bread was sold only for money. And how are you supposed to buy it if you have no money? No one will give it for free. Today, more than 35,000 descendants of Karachai Balkar refugees live in Turkey, Syria, countries of West Europe, USA, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and other countries. As many other refugees, Luba had only brother and grandmother, who was at her 70s in 1944. They tried to survive as best they could. There were 15 families in one barrack. We lived and worked together. I and my brother were given 500 grams of bread per day and my grandma was given only 300 grams. It was obvious that she couldn't survive. Such tragedies, such grief, it was beyond her strength. She died after three to four months. So there only me and my brother left. He was 14. After the war was over, life seemed to get right. The war was over and me and my brother were given medals for valiant labor. Our village supported us a lot, even if we were kids. Lubova Skatovna and her relatives are grateful to people who supported them, who shared their house and bread with them. They shared their house with us. Such a good people. There are no such people anywhere else. We went to boarding school to study. However, we didn't have any money to live. All our schoolmates went home at the weekend. But what should we do? Where could we go? What were we supposed to eat? Then my brother told me, I think that we'd better go to work rather than study. So we started to work. Only 1957 accusations of exiled nations were withdrawn. Many of those people came back to their motherland, but some of them, as our friend, started their families in Kazakhstan. There was an old man in the village. He was quite tall and wore a long beard. And he used to say, 
This girl will be my daughter-in-law. My son will marry her when he will come back home. His son was in the army and he served four more years after the war was over. And this old man found an educated person and asked him to write a letter to Stalin, in which he asked Stalin to let his son go home. And three months later, after his son came home, in May of 1949, and this old man, who used to tell that this girl will be my daughter-in-law, he noticed you, huh? You said it. I was quite uncomfortable about it. I thought, I wish he left me alone. However, the village was small. There was only one street and I saw him every day. Every day, always. And in October of 1949, I married his son. Of course, Luba kept thinking of returning home. Her husband was also full of determination to move all his family to Caucasus. However, the same as the decision of her marriage, the decision about staying in Kazakhstan was made by her father-in-law. 1957. Refugees were free to return to their homelands. Because before that, they were forbidden to do it. Then my brother decided to go to Caucasus. He came to me and said, Well, my sister, I think we'd better go too. I said, I'll go with you. When in the evening my father-in-law came home, I told him about my decision, and he said that he wanted to go with me. Okay, we'll go together. And I hadn't slept all night long. He was too old for that sharp change in his life. He was already 40 when he wrote a letter to Stalin. I thought, how can I take him away? He will miss his motherland. So how many children do you have? Nine. Nine? Nine. And how many grandchildren? Uh, 25. Are you serious? Yes. And what about great-grandchildren? I think about 35. Lubov Askatovna has a very big family. Nine children, 25 grandchildren, 35 great-grandchildren. And now there are about one-third part of whole possible amount of the family. But in any case, at the first call they all gathered in the house of their mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. I am not going to have a dig at figuring out who of them are daughters-in-law, daughters, granddaughters or great-granddaughters. And the ethnic mix is quite diverse. Kazakhs, Russians, Tatars, Kyrgyz, anyone. However, today let's stay focused on Balkar culture. One of the daughter-in-laws, Sapiat, will teach us to cook today. Well, my dear gourmets and fans of Caucasian cuisine, today we're exploring Balkar cuisine and we're going to cook kitchens and what is more in an authentic Balkar style. Meet Sapiat. She's our guide to the world of Balkar cuisine. Did I say it correctly? Do you call it kitchens? Yes, of course, you're right. Thin, unleavened dough. I mean that Chechens and Ingush make dough with kefir and eggs, but Karachai Balkars use only water and salt. Karachai Balkars. As I understood, they are kindred ethnicities. Yes, Karachai Balkars are the one ethnicity. They are very close. They have the same culture, customs, language, traditions and so on. I am Karachai and my husband is Balkar. So I am married to a Balkar. So in terms of your family, you can divide on Karachai and Balkars. 
I don't know exactly what recipe is used to cook those kitchens that are loved so much by citizens of Almaty, but those ones that I tried in that house, they were divine. So what the dough consists of? Water, water and salt. Beautiful. And here are meat and onions. Nothing else? No, nothing else. We used two types of filling, cheese and meat. Yat kitchen and Pishla kitchen. And more about Pishla kitchen. The filling consists of suluguni, sheep cheese and some mashed potatoes. Homemade cheese? Homemade. Only homemade. And have you got any other criteria? Should it be dry or soggy? Fresh. And the way of making was quite interesting to me. I am going to show you and you are going to repeat after me. If your hands keep sticking to the dough, you can roll it in flour. The dough is very soft and it can, it can be sticky. One lives and learns. I am seeing such option for the first time. We were talking while we were making dough products and we got to know each other. Sampiat, whose culinary skills cannot be unnoticed, is not a housewife, as you could think. That beautiful young mother of two children works as a teacher of economy subjects at university. My older daughter goes to elementary school and she told me that when they ask about their parents, she said proudly that her mother is a teacher. So she likes this fact. Yes, she's proud of it. And how does mommy teacher manage to cook all that delicious food? In the evenings, after work. And I can see that you're experienced cook. It is seen that you cook every day. I was taught by my mother, then by my mother-in-law. She loves our customs, Karachai Balkan traditions. Karachai Balkans never have a holiday table without kitchens. It is the most popular dish. Now kitchens can be fried. Each Caucasian woman has her own special frying pan. Castine is the best. And without a drop of oil, each kitchen should be fried on this pan. And very important moment, kitchens puff up during the process of frying and you should catch a moment when it reached its maximum. As soon as it hits the peak, kitchen should be removed from a frying pan. And notice that they don't use any spatulas and other things. Hands only. Ready kitchens should be covered with butter and served on a table. One more dish that we tasted today is called sokta, which means sausage. Liver, rice, fat are stuffed into sheep casings and stomach and then boiled. And sokta is served with special sauce, Tuzluk. It is made from homemade yogurt, salt, pepper and garlic. It must be said that many other dishes of many different cuisines can be served in this family, as well as many different songs can be heard. And a few words about beautiful Balka dress. I don't know, maybe in this situation it would be right to say Karachai dress. So, as I can see, this is an imitation of an authentic dress. Yes, in old times a mountaineer woman's dress could tell a lot about her, her marital, social status, her region. In former times Karachai Balka clothes were made of velvet and velour. Belts were made of precious stones and precious metals. So there were jewelries that were given from one person to other and they could be stitched from one dress to other. Yes, from generation to generation, from mother to daughter and so on. 
Of course, now such costumes are made mostly for dancers. But there were days when young Balkar women used to wear not only those hard belts, but also special corsets, which were put off only at the wedding night. Undervest, long down to their ankles, koilek and kaftan on top. It is similar to men's chokka, strict with a belt to emphasize gracious silhouette of a person. And girls should be slim and have slim waist to wear such belts. And the waist emphasizes silhouette. And each of that pictures and patterns should not repeat and it is made of gold and silver threads. So it is a holiday shawl, isn't it? Yes. I think each girl dreams of such shawl. Those shawls are still popular. As their warmer option, handmade of course, women still wear such shawls. I think that it is connected to climate conditions, the weather. I mean you just cover yourself up and walk. And while we were talking to Grandma Lubov Askatovna, she said that old women always wear a sleeveless jacket. Yes, it is called Jemesis, and they wear it everywhere, at home, when they go out. So I think that they do it when their waists are not so slim anymore and they cannot wear belts. So mountaineer women, as usual, are ones of the best in knit work, huh? Of course, each mountaineer woman, each woman should be able to knit. And what about men's clothes? I think that all of you are familiar with Chokka. This hat has many qualities. Beside the fact that it warms you when it's cold, it protects you from sun when it's summer. And one more detail. When you are seeking for conspiracy, it also can help you. You can look at beautiful clothes of Karachai Balkars during dancing on holidays. They dance Lesginka as all of Caucasian people. But as distinguished from Chechen Lesginka, Karachai dancers can keep an eye contact with their dance partners. Moreover, a young man who invited a girl to dance follows her all dance long. And a girl dances graciously and softly as a mountaineer girl should do. Well, we've tasted amazing dishes, we've learned how to cook, we've looked at beautiful embroidery and we've learned a lot of new interesting things. And the story of Lubov Askatovna's life is worth of picturization. She lived a lot of bright and unforgettable moments. One of the most interesting stories which her children and grandchildren love to tell is about she came close to death during German occupation. And he closes up to me and kicks me. You bastard, he says. I'll kill you. I can spare a bullet for you. Don't come here anymore. And he didn't shoot at me. Maybe he felt pity for me. Maybe. Lubov Askatovna remembers a lot of interesting stories which have been happening to her for all her 86 years. But as that day when she was chased by German Shepherd and the jailer threatened her with bayonet, as during those severe years, when people were starving, in any situation, in any case, she remained strong and incredibly kind. Each story should have happy ending. And when in the end of the story you see how the whole family gathers under one roof, it is clear that you couldn't wish for anything better. <laughs> What those stories can teach us? I think that the main lesson could be learned is that the most precious things in life are kindness, friendship and mutual help. One day Kazakhstan gathered more than 100 nations under its big Shan Iraq and today we still share meals, celebrate holidays and share the recipes for friendship.